Welcome to the Hope Sports Podcast, where athletes share the ups and downs of their journey to the top and the moments along the way that gave them profound purpose. I'm your host, Olympic gold medalist, Laura Wilkinson. Before this week's interview, I honestly didn't know that much about the Iditarod. It's called the last great race on earth, and it spans a thousand miles of Alaska's most beautiful and brutal terrain. Today we have with us four-time champion and the youngest person to win that title, Dallas Seavey. Dallas was initially an Olympic hopeful in wrestling, and in this episode, you'll hear what caused him to give that up. He'll tell you about some of the most challenging moments on the trail and about how the Iditarod is more than a mental or physical test. It's an emotional one. I was blown away by what I learned from Dallas, and I'm sure you will be too. Thanks for joining us. Here we go. Welcome, Dallas CV. We are so excited to have you on the Hope Sports Podcast today. Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad <laughs> to be able to talk to you. Well, let's kind of set the stage a little bit. We, I want to know more about your background because you're already an Iditarod legend, but I know there was another sport that you excelled at beforehand. Can you tell us a little bit about your whole like growing up in sports? Yeah, I've been surrounded by sports my entire life. Um, starting out when I was five years old, my dad competing in the Iditarod professionally, um, and that really was the center of my childhood was preparing teams to compete at the top level. So sports has always been a big part of my life. Um, in my you know, youth, I got into wrestling, which was kind of a way for, I think, my, my dad to um, put me in a situation that I could excel and have my own life. Both my older brothers were obviously bigger and better at everything, and they were both very accomplished in the mushing world. So <laughs> by lining me up in wrestling, it kind of gave me my own, my own sort. Um, and also my grandpa and my dad had a history of wrestling as well, so... Um, that was a, you know, for many years, my, my life was focused around wrestling and that was my plan to wrestle as long as my body held up and then return to mushing, you know, when I'm 30, 35, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my body didn't, uh, quite make it that far. <laughs> I made it to, um, I guess I wrestled my last match when I was 19. And at that point I was, uh, the highest ranked, um, junior in the u.s they had been on the junior world team represented the u.s in lithuania i became the first alaskan to win a national title in olympic style wrestling wow um and yeah so i was on a good course i was training at the olympic training center in northern michigan at uh, northern michigan university and very very good setup good coaching and everything was going great until i had a few few too many concussions and uh they said you're done <laughs> so and how did you take that i mean yeah. did you see that coming or were you kind of devastated no it, it yeah i was devastated uh. <laughs> um i think to be successful in any sport you have to you know be in it wholeheartedly you can't kind of do something and expect to excel at it and i had built my life around wrestling for really for seven years that everything i did was you know, the question is, is this going to help me be a better wrestler? Whatever, whatever the question or problem before me was, you know, the normal day-to-day -day life choices, practicing, whatever, um, is this going to help me reach my goal? And when you build your life around something like that, that becomes who you are. And mm -hmm. then when that gets taken away, it really opens up a big question of what now, who am I now? Um, and so, yeah, it was, that was definitely a low point for me, uh, you know, where do I turn my focus? I had built up success as a wrestler to be such a huge thing. Um, mm -hmm. And for that to go away was, you know, created a pretty big void. So how did you fill that void? Like, did you stay at school or did you go back home? Like, how? what were your next steps? How do you, yeah, how do you walk past that? It's a big deal. Yeah, I, it, yeah it was a very big deal for me. Um, and, you know, oh, two things. One, I've always, I think, had the benefit of being able to see the bigger picture at times, not always as your initial reaction, but upon contemplation, you start looking at it and say, you know what, in the scope of things, I'm pretty dang blessed to be where I am and have as many things going right as what I have going right. There's always somebody who has it worse, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that was helpful, just being able to look at the broader spectrum. I have you know, a great family I'm surrounded by people that care about me. Um, uh, otherwise, I'm a healthy person. You know, the issues I'm dealing with with the concussion stuff uh, will will pass. Um, so these are these are small issues. These are things we can deal with. But that's hard to understand when you're in that position. You may be able to tell yourself those things, but really feeling it or believing it 
um, is a lot harder to do. And it's easy to, you know, see what you should think, but it's another thing to make yourself think it. So for me, I kind of returned to my mushing, mushing roots. Um, mostly what it was is dogs have always been my best friends and my closest companions. I was homeschooled all the way through high school uh despite wrestling for the high school i was still homeschooled through that um and so i i saw a group of absolutely fantastic just very talented athletes in my dad's kennel uh two-year-olds so i kind of took on the job of training them and taking them through the iditarod as just a developmental thing kind of our college program for sled dogs where they train and compete in the iditarod but non-competitively so i kind of immersed myself in that got back to the the roots and where I felt comfortable wilderness and dogs. So, and that, did that like lead right into racing or how did that work out? Not specifically. It was kind of something to do in the interim. I've always been the personality type that I need to be doing something, um, something that I can really sink myself into something that's challenging and complex, preferably. Um, so that was supposed to just be a, a short term, you know, figure out what to do next sort of a thing. It was two years later when I decided to uh, start my own kennel and develop my own racing team. And I, you know, by then I had kind of come to grips with, yeah, I guess this was the plan. I was going to wrestle till I couldn't. And then I was going to go back to mushing. So just because <laughs> it happened sooner, um, you know, what are plans? <laughs> Only something to be changed, I suppose. I-, I love it. Just rolling with the punches. It's awesome. So I guess what kind of made you fall in love with the mushing part? Was it just that kind of that comfort factor or were you just good at it? Like what really kind of made you say, okay, now I'm going to take that next step and open my whole own kennel. Cause that's a big deal. I mean, how many dogs do you have? Right now I've got about 80 adult dogs in my yard. And in the last, actually in the last two weeks, I've had uh, about 15 new. So <laughs> this, yeah, it just grew a little bit. So I have quite a <laughs> large group of dogs. You know, we're generally generally right around the hundred dog mark. Um, and then with a hundred dogs come right now, I think we have seven or eight people that are mm-hmm. full-time staff working with dogs. So they become your family as well. Um, so it's, it's a lot of responsibility. It's a definitely a big step. Now, when you get into the sport, I don't think you start with that. I started with 16 dogs and myself. And so it grows over time, of course. But um, I think what I, what I love about mushing and what, drew me into it to do that as a profession and a lifestyle was that it is very complex. It's very multifaceted. And I think it rewards the right traits. As a wrestler, you learn to push yourself. You learn that there's always more. You learn how to dig deeper. Um, As a musher, I find myself in more of a coaching capacity, which is more of a kind of developmental and nurturing capacity almost. So you, yes, you have to have that deep grit. You have to be able to dig deep and get through the blizzards and go eight days without sleeping. But you have to be able to do that with compassion. You have to do that without losing your sense of feel. Um, you know, to be able to run a team successfully, you have to love them. You have to care about them and love them and be able to feel everything they feel. And so to have the toughness but yet be able to keep that caring side open is a, a big challenge. And I think that's something that you know, helps me grow as a person. And then also has been the root of a lot of our success is that um, we're willing to feel, feel everything. It's the only way to make good decisions is to have all the information. The only way to have information is by feeling. Wow, that is so good. That is so good. Now, you became the youngest musher to win the Iditarod when you captured that title in 2012 at the age of 25. Is that right? And then That's you also correct. also won in 2014, 2015, and 2016. And I really have to just quote something that I I loved that I read. Um, after your fourth win, you were explaining what that accomplishment meant to your family. And you said, it's just another day of mushing, man. That's what we do. <laughs> I just love it. You just have this just such even keelness about you. But I mean, like you just said, it's a thousand mile long race, eight days of no sleep, and you're trying to be compassionate through blizzards and coaching, you know, your way through it. Like how, how can you stay focused for that long a period of time in those conditions? Yeah. The Iditarod is the never ending day. That's the best way to explain it. Um, you don't look at the race as an eight day race. You look at it as 200 hours of consecutive go. (laughs) Um, 
And it really is the one time in the year that I have to make every right decision and I have to stay absolutely focused through every piece of this. Um, everything we do has to be done well and thoroughly and correctly. Uh, even sleeping is stressful because you lay down and you have a 30 minute chance to sleep. You know, as soon as you lay down, if you're not instantly asleep, you start thinking to yourself, I've got to sleep. I, there's no way I'm going to stay awake. And then all of a sudden there's this pressure. And then many mushers face the problem of when they do doze off, they jolt awake with an adrenaline rush for fear that they've overslept because that is common. There's nobody out there in the remote Alaska. And uh, if you don't wake up when your alarm clock goes off or in your sleep deprived haze, you set it incorrectly for a.m. instead of p.m. or something, um, you may well sleep for eight hours, and there goes your whole race. Um, but I think to touch back on what you, you know, that comment um, that you shared after, I guess it was the 2016 I did a rod, that fourth race that we that we won, um, I think that's a really important point that's oftentimes overlooked. We put so much pressure on the event, on the race itself, that it's a big deal. And that's something we choose to do. Uh, I see many mushers that train very hard. They work hard to make it to the race and they go into a race with so much pressure that if they don't succeed, the whole year has been a waste or that their, you know, friends and supporters and family or sponsors are going to be judgmental of their performance. And it's very important for me to have the right mindset and go into the race and saying, okay, I've had a great year of training with my dogs. I've enjoyed this year. I've done what I've loved. I'm so fortunate to be able to spend my time mushing around the wilderness in Alaska with a bunch of sled dogs and be able to call that work. So <laughs> the race is a free roll. We're out here. We're going to have fun. The year has already been a good year regardless of what happens in the next eight days. And that is the only way that you can be free enough to make the right decisions. On an I did a rod, you're, you're going to have to make a decision at some point that you believe just cost you the race and but it's the right thing to do right now for this team. And three days later, you pinpoint that as the pivotal turning point in the race. And you have to be willing to give up on your hope to win the race to be able to do what's right for the team. You do what's right for the team, and that causes you to do well in the race. Oh, I love the integrity that you have and just the way you come at this stuff. It's so good for for every athlete in every sport and, and just in life in general. I mean, this is, wow, this is some good stuff. So I have to ask you, since your teammates that you're coaching don't exactly speak your language all the time, like, how do you, I mean, I guess, do you just have to really learn each dog so well and like what they need and what they're, I, I mean, how, yeah, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, they don't speak my language, but I like to think that I speak their language. <laughs> um, you know, it's, you know them very well. For example, Beetle, he has raced many of my races with me. I got him as a two-year-old. Um, he was on my first Iditarod winning team and raced with me the year before that when we won uh, the Yukon Quest, which is kind of the other 1,000-mile dog sled race. I've run over 30,000 miles with that dog. Um, now, this isn't at 60 miles an hour like your car. This is at 8 to 9 miles an hour. And for every hour of actual traveling, there's nearly an hour of time that we spend sleeping on the trail together or you know, feeding the dogs, plus all the time year round, taking care of them in the kennel when we're not in serious training. So yes, you notice everything. Um, if your eyes are open, you notice everything. You see when they come out in their, of their house and they look a little bit tired, you, you know what they're feeling, mm -hmm. if you're willing to feel what they're feeling. <laughs> so yeah, you get to know them very well. Um, but unlike people, if you're not looking for it, they won't tell you. A human will tell you I'm tired. A human will tell you I'm hungry or I, I need to take it easier. Um, a dog, you know, you've got to be watching for it. And they want to do their best every day. So a lot of times they're, they're mentally excited to go, but you've got to be able to assess their physical side and say, hey, we're going to take it easy today. You know, even mm -hmm. though mentally you think you're ready to rock and roll, it's time to back off. Mm. Definitely. Now, on the race side of things, because it's a long race, are you seeing your competitors or are you guys all kind of spread out and you have no idea if you're in the lead or if you're in third? Like, do you have kind of a grasp of where you are? A grasp is probably the right word for it. <laughs> um, not an accurate, uh, you know, down to the second by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there are about 20 checkpoints along the way on the Iditarod. That's the only place you're going to get information. When you come into those checkpoints, 
they'll have a printout maybe posted in the checkpoint or you can ask the checkers there, you know, where am I? Mm -hmm. um, and what they'll have is the information of when other mushers arrived and departed. Um, now, again, you don't have to stop in the checkpoint. So a musher may go through a checkpoint and then go five miles down the trail and camp. Um, so you have a feel for where you are. And in the beginning, there's so many mushers around because the race is still very compressed. By the time you get towards the end, you know, if you're in the lead, you're you have three or four mushers around you that you're really kind of keeping an eye on. And you do start to pay attention to them in the last couple hundred miles. Where are they at? You know, for me, I'm trying to win as easily as possible. How do I take the least amount of risk? Um, I'm very comfortable being within minutes of a second place team as long as I have the stronger team. So that's mm -hmm. my goal is to position myself with a stronger, faster team and then keep my competition close. Such a strategic race. That's really cool. Um, can you, and I'm sure you've had many of these, but can you give us an example of like a tough situation that you've had during one of your Iditarod races and like how you got through it? Sure. Um, well, <laughs> the first one that comes to mind was actually in the 2014 Iditarod. Um, it was a very, very fast and brutal race, low very low snow conditions caused the race to be incredibly fast, but it also caused the trail to be very rough. Mm -hmm. Generally, we, we count on a lot of snow, particularly crossing the Alaska range. As we go through those mountains, we count on a lot of snow to mitigate the terrain differences and, uh, you know, kind of mellows everything out. Mm -hmm. That particular year, the, the trail had no snow. And as a musher, we just got beat to pieces for a thousand miles by, bouncing around on frozen dirt, trees, stumps, the whole works. The sleds aren't designed to drive on dirt. Um, I think any musher you talk to will identify the 2014 I did rod as the toughest race they ever ran. Mm. Um, because of the high speed of the race and kind of my particular style, um, I'm generally a closing team. I'm usually coming from behind. Um, I was a little bit out of the contention as far as winning it. I felt, um, in the last 300 miles, I went from a 10 hour deficit and I got it down to a three hour deficit. And, um, I thought that was all the closer we we're going to make it long story short. We left the last checkpoint and I was in third place, three hours behind first, no real hopes of catching up with them. And I was happy with a third place finish that year. It was a challenging race and the dogs had done exceptionally well. Um, but instead of having the casual run to the finish, the last 70 miles or so of just, you know, mushing through the hills and down the coast and into the, the city of Nome where the race finishes, we got hit with one of the most intense storms anybody ever remembers on the Iditarod with uh, wind gusts of up to 90 miles an hour. Um, the dogs <laughs> literally could not stand up in those gusts of wind. The first one that hit us, it laid every single dog out on their side. It flipped my sled over and we were sliding sideways across the sea ice with no snow, all the snow had blown away. So we were on frozen, you know, ice and rocks. Um, and I kind of just hunkered down until the gust of wind let up. And then we took off again. Uh, now the wind's only blowing, you know, 40 miles an hour. We made it about a hundred yards and the next gust of wind counts. Oh my goodness. So after getting knocked over for about an hour, you start thinking we've got another 40 miles of this to go. There's no way we're going to make it 40 miles. Um, so you, this is the time for what I call short-term view. You know, there are times that you need to be able to zoom out and look at the next 10 years or the next six months um, or the next six days or even the next six hours. But there are times that you only have to make it six seconds. All I'm going to do is when this wind lets up, when this gust of wind lets up, I'm going to talk to these dogs in a calm way. I'm going to reassure them. We're going to stand up and we're going to make it 100 yards. And then we're going to get hit with the next gust of wind. All I've got to do is take one more step and you do that long enough and you make it 40 miles. Um, so I, we struggled through the storm, just one little shot at a time. We'd kind of make a sprint when the gust of wind would let up and then we'd get wiped out when the gust came back. Um, long story short, we did that for many hours, finally pulled into the finish line in Nome only to find out that the two teams ahead of us, one of them didn't make it. Um, they ended up getting rescued by snowmobiles. The other team had to hunker down at a shelter cabin along the way. Um, so I went from entering that storm in third place, three hours behind first, 
to coming out and crossing the finish line in first place. And I actually did not know I had won the race until about two minutes after the finish. <laughs> when, uh, oh. when the next musher arrived, somebody I figured had finished long before. So, um, there are times in life and in sports, I think all you got to worry about is the next 10 seconds. What is the best thing that I do right now? Don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. What do I do right now? That is the right choice. That is the ethical choice. That's the right thing for my team. Um, you take that step and, you know, kind of have faith that that leads you in the right direction. I love this. You were just dropping truth bombs all over the place. I'm going to have to save this episode and listen to it over and over again when I'm having a hard time. Thank you for this. (laughs) Now, you have a book that you wrote, too, called Born to Mush. Now, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, you know, that's something I think that, uh, well, I wrote that after we won the Iditarod in 2012. My sponsors um, at the time were, you know, interested in doing that. It's something we had talked about if we accomplished you know, our, our goal of becoming the youngest person to win the Iditarod. But I didn't really feel right um, trying to author an autobiography or something at the age of 25. That seems a little premature to me. <laughs> um, so I consented to writing a book that would be a factual book for young adults with, you know, kind of that 10 to 14 age range in mind. However, it was written in such a way that it's a, an enjoyable light read for an adult. It's not childish in nature. It's just not complex either. So it's, mm-hmm. um, it's a light read. It's a fun read for an adult. And I think it uh, resonates with, um, kind of some younger folks. I think it carries some, some things that I feel are truths that, um, you know, might be helpful at that phase in people's lives. So that's the, that's the book I've written. And, um, yeah, I hope the next one's written once I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, switching gears a little bit, you were also on a TV show called the ultimate survival Alaska. And there were, I think you were on all three seasons, right now. Tell us about this show. Cause it sounds kind of intense. That's correct. <laughs> it was, that was actually a lot of fun. Yeah, it was intense, but, um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Shoot, I got to fly around and see all of Alaska on National Geographic's dime. I can't hardly complain. It doesn't matter if you don't get to eat or you have to you know, survive in the wilderness. That I've been doing that my whole life. So um, I got to see parts of Alaska in the summertime that I had never seen before. You know, most of my adventures in Alaska have taken place in the winter. So, for example, it was with that show that I got to see the Yukon River in the summer for the first time. And I had mushed down the frozen Yukon River many times, but I finally got to see it thawed. <laughs> um, got to build a log raft and float the river. So that was very neat. <laughs> it was um, it was definitely a challenging competition in places. Um, but I found that my lifestyle as an Iditarod musher definitely played to my, you know, definitely helped me out there. Um, there's times that, again, you don't think about, I'm going to be out here for 50 days or 90 days or whatever the time frame was. It's just, well, I just got to make it till tomorrow. Tomorrow will be better. Um, you know, the delusional optimist is a great way to get, what, to get <laughs> through hard, hard times. <laughs> um, you know, just one day at a time. And, you know, it's, it's incredible what, what you can accomplish like that. You know, um, for example, the Iditarod is a thousand miles. Everybody who's ever won the Iditarod or finished the Iditarod has done so one step at a time. It's just one smart step after the next. And you do that long enough and you focus on the step you're taking now, not three or four days from now. And pretty soon you look back at a pretty impressive just string of good steps. And that's all we're trying to do is make one good decision at a time, one smart step at a time. And it's so easy to become overwhelmed when you look at it as a thousand mile race. Nope. It's just one step at a time. Take each of those as best you can. Sometimes you make mistakes, but tomorrow's a new day and you know, we'll have the opportunity to make a better step or to learn from our mistakes. Love it. Now in 2017, you finished second to your biggest competitor, your dad, Mitch. And he's also a three-time champion. He's the oldest <laughs> yeah. in history. You were the youngest. He's the oldest. And he's what, 57? Yep. So I'm guessing you guys aren't competitive at all. <laughs> um, bitterly competitive in a very good way. My dad is my best friend, but um, I think it's I think it's really become some very honest competition. Where just like, oh, how do I say this? Because it's my dad. Because I care about him. Um, 
it does two things. One, I know him very well. You know, for many years, I was by his side helping him train his team. I was kind of his main handler or trainer the year that he won the Iditarod for his first time in 2004. And I took a lot of personal pride in that team and what they accomplished. So I had been so closely involved. Both my older brothers had gone off to college and I was the handler. Um, By knowing him so well, I know his flaws, if you will, (laughs) not to call them flaws, but I know where he's likely to make mistakes, his weaknesses. Um, so it's, it's really tough because you don't want to prey on that necessarily. But ultimately, at the bottom of it all, at the end of the day, it teaches you to race and compete against people and still care about them and love them. I'm mm-hmm. not racing against my dad. Both me and my dad are racing against the trail. We're racing against you know our own issues. We're trying to develop our best team. We're each trying to do the best we possibly can. And yeah, we fight tooth and nail at the end of that race. Uh, 2016, we pushed each other hard. I ended up winning that one, but by a very narrow margin, only about 40 minutes between us. When it was all said and done, I think third place came in seven hours later. Because we were pushing each other, because we were driving each other to be the best version of ourselves, to do the best we could, it made both of us excel. And that's what competition is for. In my mind, the purpose of competition is that when we see somebody else accomplish something, when we see them lift a bigger weight than we've ever been able to lift or run a faster mile than we've been able to do, we know that that is humanly possible. We know it is possible for us to dream of that and then ultimately achieve that. The point of competition is to push ourselves to be better, not to try to break down the other one to you know, succeed over them, but to make us be better. Mm-hmm. Well, so since you helped your dad when you were growing up, do you have all his secrets and you've just added on to it? Or is, is he now trying to find out your secrets? <laughs> oh, very, very much so. Um, <laughs> you know, we have a good, friendly rivalry. Uh, my, my mentality has always been one of, you know, I've always worked on creating and improving and developing. And I think I'm a little more free-spirited in trying new things and developing. We put a lot of our energy into research and development, everything from training tactics to the equipment we use, everything. We're trying to expand and to grow. Um, My dad's strength is, one, he has some very good dogs genetically. He's very good at producing good dogs. He's very good at running a large kennel. His kennel is quite a lot larger than mine, so he's generally working with more potential athletes than I am. I think my strength is more in development. So I have fewer top, top notch dogs, but I think I can develop them farther. So um, we both have our strengths and weaknesses. We both learn from each other. But uh, I think just by nature of age, when I got into this seriously at 20 something years old, I think that's a time in your life that you are looking to do things differently. Whereas my dad at that time was 50 something when he was beginning to be more in a pattern or a routine. And I think my racing and being successful in racing forced him to break that pattern and continue to grow rather than kind of settle into a day-to-day routine and keep doing the same thing over and over. So I think we have certainly both been helpful. Um, I think how we race now, because racing has changed, I'm not using the same specific tactics or anything like that that my dad used when he was racing earlier. But what he did teach me was how to learn, how to work, how to you know, be a good human. And that's something that follows you everywhere. So yes, I will forever be grateful for the childhood that I had. Um, I didn't like it at the time. (laughs) You know, I think (laughs) at the time I felt like I was free labor. Um, We worked very hard, but you know, he taught me the more valuable things that follow you through life beyond sports and the actual sport. I think my dad races more now like me than vice versa. His style more mirrors mine than the other way around is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Oh, that's very cool. I love it. Well, after this very exciting competition with you and your dad in 2017, unfortunately, four of your 16 dog team tested positive. um, And that the circumstances surrounding that test have led some to believe that it was accidental or, as you've claimed, an intentional attempt to sabotage by an outside party. And I know you've protested it this past year by withdrawing from the Iditarod so what what kind of has happened from this and how have you, I guess, you know, kept that positive attitude that you are so good at and how have you kind of moved forward and, and moved on? 
Yeah. Oh, well, that's been probably one of the toughest challenges of my life has been dealing with this issue specifically. Um, you know, and the, the way that it was rolled out was um, not ideal. Let's put it that way. Um, I felt that there was a lot of kind of funny business going on in there for sure. Um, we run completely holistic kennel. I mean, I spend thousands of dollars on mineral supplementation. All of our medical care is homeopathic and we major on Eastern medicine. Obviously, if a dog eats something, you know, a rock that's too big to make it through their system, I am very grateful for Western medicine and veterinarians that'll cut in there and <laughs> remove the rock. Yes. Um, but as far as an athlete, you know, our focus has always been about creating the healthiest possible dog. That's setting them up for success. And this starts at day one. Everything from mental health, you know, being an active, uh, well acclimated puppy all the way to being a healthy dog that's able to compete in a thousand mile race. So it was a really strange thing, partially because I always conducted myself on a principled basis. You try not to look at, will this decision affect me positively or negatively in the next 10 minutes, but what kind of person do I want to be? You know, that broader question. And, you know, ethics is at the core of everything we do. So to get you know, an accusation like that is it completely undermines everything you've done, you know, 10 years previously and everything that I value. Um, so it was, I, I took it very, very personally, quite frankly. Um, it's impossible to know what did happen, but I can tell you what didn't happen. And that is nobody in my team or involved with us, first of all, had access to the drugs that were there as an opiate that actually acts as a sedative in a dog. It was given two to four hours prior to a guaranteed mandatory drug test. And it was given also inversely two to four hours after the finish of the race. So when you look at this information, it's pretty clear that however the drug got into the system, it sure as heck wasn't by the musher after the race was over before a guaranteed drug test. It's actually the only guaranteed drug test in the entire race is every musher in the top 20 is tested at the finish of the race. So um, anyway, it's been really challenging for me, partially because it wasn't acknowledged that information. It was rolled out in such a way that it looked to all the casual observers that, oh, the musher drugged their dogs. But when you actually look at the information, it's completely ridiculous that somebody's going to give their own dog a sedative two hours after the finish of the race and, you know, right before a mandatory drug test. So fortunately for me, um, it was such a high dose at such an obscure time or such a, you know, <laughs> obvious time that it's going to cause a positive test that for the people in Alaska to follow the, this, the race and know me personally, especially, it was never really a question of whether or not we gave it to the dogs. But I think that's going to be clarified here shortly. It's without a doubt the toughest two years of my life. Um, just dealing with the, you know, the assumption, of course, every athlete that has a positive test, the first thing is, Oh, it wasn't me. But what do you do when it really wasn't you? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it makes it so challenging. Fortunately, um, 10 years in the sport, the, the competitors that knew me, as soon as my name was, um, combined with the positive test people said oh we know that dallas wouldn't have done that and i fortunately had the support of my peers and competitors throughout this whole thing and that's been um yeah that's been majorly helpful but i guess that's the value of conducting yourself in an ethical way day to day is you never know when that curveball is going to hit you and mm -hmm. you know, people are going to look at what they know about you and say does this fit or not and in this case they said that that doesn't fit this doesn't add up so that was kind of the saving grace there. So do you think you'll race the Iditarod again? I do think that I will be back to the race. One huge improvement that the Iditarod has implemented since this incident is they've improved the security around the race big time. So now we have um, live cameras or you know cameras in the gnome dog yard. So once the dogs finish the race, they're actually being observed and watched until they are drug tested, which is very important. The food bags that we send out for the race are out of the musher's control from about three weeks, two to three weeks prior to the race's start. Um, so they've now added some tamper-proof seals to those. These were all things that were put in effect after that incident in 2017. So they've really started to crank up the security of the food that the dogs are eating along the way. And then you know, because it is an eight-day race, 
um, and I have no support team out there, I have to sleep. So when I'm sleeping, who's watching my dogs? Who's making sure that they're not being tampered with? Mm-hmm. And the Iditarod is implementing those cameras and the checkpoints and things like that to help, you know, help the mushrooms make sure that their teams are secure. So yeah, I will definitely be back to the Iditarod and I'm very excited about the changes. Um, unfortunately, it took an, an incident like this to cause those changes. Yeah. But at least, like you said, there is some positive momentum moving forward, and that's always a good thing. Now, you had another great quote because you yeah. apparently say a lot of things that I like. Uh, and this was about the idea, Rob, but I think it's just good <laughs> for for anything and any athlete in any sport. You said, as soon as I find myself racing for one more win or one more record, I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. And that's the time we need a change of scenery. So what are your reasons? What does push you and motivate you? Like, what are the right reasons that you keep going? I think the right reasons is when you can sit here and say, you know, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. Um, you know, I know as both a human athlete and now, you know, I say coaching a team of dogs, I'm still a fairly physical job <laughs> when you travel a thousand <laughs> miles by dog sled. Um, it's still a fairly physical job, but not and it's in a different way than as a wrestler. As a wrestler, you had to have very high cardio for an intense nine-minute match. Uh, now it's you know prolonged agony for nine days. So it's a little bit different. <laughs> um, but you've got to love the pure joy of doing it. You have to love every single day of this. And I think this goes back to what we talked about before. Um, when we say, you know, this is just what we do. The race is a free roll. The training, the season, that's the part you have to love. Otherwise, you will find yourself where you feel that you've suffered through all this conditioning, suffered through all this training, to now have your glory moment on the competition. You have to love the training. You have to love the lifestyle. And then you can be free enough in the competition to perform at your highest. As soon as you put undue pressure on competition day, it's it's not going to help your performance. It's not going to help you do better by, quite frankly, having fear which really is what it is. When you have a lot of anxiety on game day, a lot of times it's fear of non-fail or non-performance or fear of failure. So by being content and happy with the lifestyle you live, by feeling like I love training, I love conditioning, I love getting better at my sport, I love growing, it's helping me grow as a person, I think that allows us to be free enough to say, you know, yeah, it's race day, we'll see what happens. We'll do our best. That's the only promise I'm going to make. But if I feel like I'm going into the training season and planning to suffer through the next six months of training so that I get to race, that's not a good reason to race. I'm going to go through the next six months because this is what I love doing with my dogs. And because I love doing that, I will also get to run the race. Um, But my value as a human is not going to be determined by the next nine days or by this event. That's not the purpose. I get to choose that. I'm going to retain that power to myself. Uh, by doing what I love every single day, not just on game day, but every day. I love doing this. I would tell you to drop the mic, but I do have like two more questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. I want to know what you want to be remembered for. Oh, I, I think that's a question for when I'm, I'm 99 years old and have nothing better to do. And I'm sitting on my rocking chair on the porch. Then I'll think about that. Um, that also <laughs> incidentally is the is the time to start counting records um, and counting accomplishments. You know, that's right now all we focus on is the next day. And I think, I don't know about what you want to be remembered for, but I do know how I want to conduct myself on a daily basis. And I think that's the best we can hope for. Um, I want to make decisions that I can be proud of. I want to be able to look back and say, yeah, I made that call. Yes, I did that action um, and be proud of that. Um, we get to decide who we are every single day, every hour, every minute. We decide who we are by the choices we make. And sometimes those are tough choices. Sometimes the, you know, the outcome that we anticipate is very scary. Awesome. Well, how can we find your book, get your book, follow you on social media, follow all your next great racing adventures? How can we keep up with you? So Dallas CV on Facebook, DallasCV.com on that World Wide Web. Um, otherwise, you could write me a letter. 
<laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, Dallas, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. You are an absolute inspiration. I love I love your integrity. I love the way you think. I love your focus on your positivity and your optimism and just taking everything one step at a time. It's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you to Dallas for sharing with us on today's show. His story about surviving the windstorms during that race was incredible. The advice to take things one step at a time, it's so profound. There can be times when our finish line in life seems so far away and the obstacles are mounting all around us and it's just overwhelming. But if we can focus in on just that very next step that we need to take, step by step, we'll begin to cover the distance without even realizing it. Be sure to check out more from Dallas on his website and social media outlets, which you can find in the show notes or at hopesports.org slash podcast. And today I want to encourage you to take that next step in your life towards your goals, no matter how impossible they may seem. Step by step, you can get there too. Make sure to tune in next week as we're joined by Mexican cyclist Ingrid Drexel, who fell into the sport at a young age, but has made quite a name for herself and her country in the international cycling circuit. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss a thing. And please leave us a review because those great reviews that you're giving us, they help us continue to bring awesome guests on this show. I'm Laura Wilkinson. Thanks again for listening. This podcast is produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media. For more information on Hope Sports and to access the complete archives, please visit hopesports.org.